Psalm 51. We're going to go back to Psalm 51 this morning, and we're going to take a look at Psalm 51 again. Now, last week, we focused on what Psalm 51 tells us about God, who He is, what He is like. This week, I'd like for us to take just, just to focus on one verse. Uh, you know, there are only 19 verses in Psalm 51. It's amazing how much we've already seen there, isn't it? And we've got this week and next week to look for more. So I think that we're going to have fun finishing that off. But we're going to look at just one verse today, focus on one verse. It is Psalm 51, verse 12. It's a verse that talks about salvation. And let's discover, if we can, whose salvation uh, it talks about, whose salvation it is. Before we do that, though, let's one more time go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, through your spirit and through your word, I pray that you will speak to us today. Father, give us your truth to hear. And Lord, I pray that the words that I've prepared and the words that you've shared in your word and your Bible, and the way that your spirit speaks to our hearts, that Lord, you will enlighten and encourage us to help us to see you and to see you more clearly, to know exactly what you ask of us and from us, to help us be who you call us to be. Lord, these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Psalm 51. Psalm 51, as we've said before, is David's psalm of repentance. As a psalm of repentance, it is about sin and it's about God's forgiveness. When we repent and turn to God, when we confess our sin and repent to turn from sin and to come back to God, well, it's, it's about God's ability to forgive sin when, when I repent, when we repent. Our, our verses, our July memory verses for this, this month, uh, Psalm 51, 12, and 13, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then what will I do? Well, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and then sinners will be converted to you. I'd say that's a pretty good response from turning to God and finding that joy restored. They're really two great verses, but we're just going to focus on the first of those on verse 12. Restore to me, O Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Remember that this is a prayer, and since this is a prayer, it means that David in this verse is asking God to do two things. The two things that he's asking God to do are to restore him and to sustain him, to restore and to sustain. So what are those two words about? What is it that David is asking God to do? Well, let's start with restore. Let's start with that one. What is restore? What is just by definition, what does it mean? Well, it means that something has been lost. And the psalmist, David in this case, misses what's lost and he wants it back. Restore to me what's been lost. I want it back. I'm missing it. And what is it that he's lost? Well, he's lost his joy. He's lost the joy of salvation. He's lost that joy. Now, it doesn't say he's lost salvation. He's lost the joy of that salvation. All right, before it, it means that he had rejoiced. He had been enthused and excited. He'd celebrated in salvation, in the salvation that God gives. He'd been excited and full of joy about what God had done in his relationship with the Lord. Good things he was celebrating before, but, but now he's lost that joy. He's lost that excitement, that closeness. Well, what, what would happen that would cause, cause us to lose that joy? What possibly could cause someone to lose the joy of salvation. If you don't lose salvation, how could you lose the joy that goes with it? Well, the answer is pretty simple. It's sin. Sin is what steals the joy. The truth is, if we have unresolved or unrepentant sin, it will steal our joy every time. If you live in unrepentant sin, if your sin is not resolved, if you don't get things to right with God, it will with God, it will steal your joy in salvation. If things aren't right with God, it steals your joy. If we don't confess our sin, if we don't repent, it creates a separation between us and God. And if you're not close with God, if you're not connected well with God, you will not find God's joy 
in your situation. So unresolved, unrepentant sin steals the joy that God wants to give those that he has saved. It steals the joy. So in this case, David is praying because he's lost his joy and he wants it back. Restore to me, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. He misses that joy and he wants it back. Now he knows that sin is the problem. He knows that's the case. That's why this is a psalm of repentance. He's dealing with the sin. Remember all that Bathsheba and Uriah business? It's bad news. It's time to get it dealt with, time to get the sin taken care of so that he can get back to rights with God. So the first thing that he talks about is restoring that joy of salvation. What's the second one, second request that he asks? Well, he asks God to sustain him, to sustain his spirit. What does sustain mean? Well, if you look up sustain in a thesaurus, you'll find words like support and encourage and succor and, uh, and comfort and, and help for someone to help and to comfort. In the case of God, it's about God upholding us and keeping us in his love, about lifting us up and holding us close, connecting us to himself, sustain us. When God sustains us, he draws us in and he supports us in his love so that we can walk with him and live with him. So David is asking here for two things. He's asking for God to restore my joy, he says, and sustain my spirit. I want you to restore my joy and to sustain my spirit. Well, God is willing to do that, but when will God restore the joy of a sinner? When will God sustain the spirit of someone who is, is not close to him, well, that's sort of easy. He'll do that when, when I repent and my sins are forgiven, when I no longer have the sin separating me from God, then God will restore my joy and he will sustain my spirit. I think that's good news to know what repenting from sin, turning from sin finding God's forgiveness can do. It can restore the joy of salvation and it can sustain a willing spirit. So I think that's important. But what about that last phrase in, in this verse? Sustain me with a willing spirit. What's that sustain with a willing spirit business? What, what is that about? Well, a willing spirit, that means that we have a spirit willing to obey God and to strive for righteousness, to strive to live with God or for God in righteousness. It's a willingness to obey Him and to do what God asks. You see, the truth of the matter is the joy of the psalmist, he, he wants it restored, and it's restored when we trust God and obey Him. Remember that old hymn? I think it says it just like it is. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy or to to find your joy of salvation in Jesus. No other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's what this willing part is about. Sustain me with a willing spirit. Help me to be willing to obey, willing to walk in obedience, willing to walk in faith with you because that's how I keep the joy that you're going to restore to me. It's important to understand that. God's part is sustaining our spirit. Our part is being willing to obey and to do what God says. You know, I've known a lot of people through the years who say, oh Lord, help me not to, whatever the sin happens to be, help me not to smoke, help me not to drink, help me not to gamble, help me not to, to run around. You know, whatever it happens to be, I've known a lot of people say, God, help me not to do it. And God says, you don't do it and I'll help give you the spirit. To, you know, sometimes it's, it's sort of like saying, I really wish I wanted to lose weight I'd to diet. You know, if you really wish you wanted to, it means you don't really want to very much. Sometimes we really wish that we wanted to not sin so much, but we're not really very willing to change. It's not easy to change sometimes, but it's important. So unresolved sin, understand that that unresolved sin always steals our joy. The way to get that joy back to have it restored is to be willing to obey God and to strive to live in righteousness with Him. When we do that, then we repent, come back to God, and He restores the joy of our salvation. So not so bad, right? 
Well, there is one more phrase that I really want us to think about in this verse. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now, that's interesting. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I remember this is a prayer, so if it's a prayer, to whom are we speaking? Whose salvation are we speaking about? Well, it's God's salvation that we're talking about. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, Lord. Your salvation. You know, I counted, and I think that this phrase, your salvation, referring to God's salvation, I think it occurs 26 times. I I may be off, but I counted through, and I think I got 26 times where it says your salvation, referring to God and His salvation. Of those times, one is in 1 Samuel, one is in 2 Samuel, one is in Isaiah, one is in Luke, and guess where the other 22 times are? It's in the book of Psalms. Apparently, Psalms understands this idea of God's salvation, of your salvation. Apparently, David understands this idea of God's salvation. You know, we don't usually refer to salvation as God's salvation, your salvation, God. How do we usually refer to it? Well, we look at verses like Psalm 27, verse 1, that says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? When we look at verses like that, we focus on the my salvation. We think it belongs to me, it's mine, I'm saved, my salvation. And the Bible talks about that, it's okay. That's how we normally think of salvation. I, I think that um, we probably go to verses like, like Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So maybe we think if God gives us a gift, that means it belongs to us, and it's my salvation. But it's not just Psalms that talks about that. In the New Testament, I think of Philippians, Paul is speaking to the Philippian believers and he says in verse 2 in Philippians 2:12, "So then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling." He says, "Work on the salvation that you have to bear fruit for God and for godliness. Take take the salvation that you have and build on that." He says it's your salvation, speaking to the church. He says, it, it belongs to you all, to all of you, those who have given your lives to Christ. It's, it's your salvation. So it speaks of your salvation. And then I like verses like Psalm 95, 1. It says, Oh, come, let us sing to, for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. So it's about all of us and the salvation that we have if we've committed our life to Christ, if we belong to Him. Well, doesn't that mean that it's, that it's ours, that if we're redeemed, if we're born again, it, it's ours? Well, yeah, it, it sort of does. So then why does David say, it's your salvation, God? Why does he focus on the your salvation part? Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Yeah, I think it's because David gets it. David really understands. I think there is a reason that so often in the Psalms, more than any place else in the Bible, salvation is, is called God's salvation. When we're saved, we are redeemed. That means that God buys us back when we've been lost. To redeem is to buy again something that once was yours but has been lost. It's sort of like the restore that David was looking for. He saves us, He redeems us. That means that God buys us back when we're lost. He he buys us, He owns us. We are His. It is God's salvation. And we're just hanging on to it, but but it, it belongs to Him. He's the one who saves. God is the one who purchases salvation. God is the one who offers salvation. God is the one who gives salvation. God is the one who controls salvation. If you're saved, it's His salvation that you're saved to. It's it's not your way of doing things. It's God's salvation. David gets it. Salvation belongs to the Lord. You know, I expect that he he remembers Psalm 3, 8, where he said, salvation belongs to the Lord. He says, your blessing be upon your people. Salvation, Salvation belongs to whom? It belongs to the Lord. It belongs to God. Salvation is His 
It is his salvation. David gets it. Maybe that's part of why God says that David is a man after his own heart because David understands that even though I have this salvation which will let me walk with Jesus and live with Jesus, give me new life in him, that it's God's salvation. It's, it belongs to God and it's, it's all about God. It's not about me and something I have. David gets it. David seems to understand. And of course, if you if you pick some of the other verses in Psalm, so again, there, there are a number of them. Psalm 18.35 says, of, To God, you have also given me the, sh- the shield of your salvation. Your right hand upholds me. Whose salvation is it? And by his salvation, he shields me. He protects me. With his salvation, he engulfs me. He supports me. Uh, he sustains me with that, that spirit of of obedience and salvation. Or Psalm 13, verse 5, it says, I've trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in whose salvation? In your salvation, God. It'll rejoice. Uh, Whose loving kindness do I trust in according to this verse? It's God's loving kindness. And whose salvation do I rejoice in? It's God's salvation. What do we do if we've receive that salvation from God? Do we keep it to ourselves? Well, Psalm 18, verse 35 said, Let all who seek you, Lord, let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you, and let those who love your salvation say continually, Let God be magnified. Praise the Lord. Praise God. If you love God and the salvation that He gives, then say so. Praise Him Every so often, once a week or so on Sunday mornings? No, praise Him continually. Praise Him all of the time. Praise Him day after day, hour after hour, because God has let you share in His salvation to celebrate Him and praise Him. And that witnessing is emphasized again in Psalm 71, 15. It says, My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation once a month or twice. Ah, wait, no. All day long. God's goodness and His salvation to us, His righteousness and His salvation isn't just on Sunday mornings, and it's not just once or twice a month. It's every day, so each and every day we can tell of that great righteousness of God and the salvation that He gives. My mouth. Lord, my mouth will tell of your righteousness and your salvation all day long. David gets it. Salvation belongs to the Lord. We are blessed when he shares his salvation with us and lets us become a part of his salvation. David gets it. You know, those are just a a spattering of a few of the verses and the Psalms that talk about God's salvation and what it does. But I'm really intrigued by what Isaiah says regarding that salvation in Isaiah 62, verse 11. The prophet Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, or God has said, Behold, uh, the Lord is the one proclaiming to the end of the earth, Say Say to the daughter of Zion, Lo, your salvation comes... Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Notice how it talks about, notice how the prophet speaks about our salvation. It says, your salvation comes, behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Isn't that interesting? Isaiah prophesied that God's salvation would come to us in the form of a person. His reward Him, His recompense before Him. That's not about a something, that's about a someone. Isaiah says your salvation comes in the form of a person. In Isaiah's case, he's talking about a suffering servant who will come. And it's in that same vein that another prophet speaks some 700 years later in Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 2, this other prophet says in verses 29, 30, 31, and 32, he says, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, 
Israel. Notice verse 30, Luke 2 verse 30, he says, My eyes have seen your salvation. This prophet, 700 years after Isaiah, is a prophet named Simeon, a righteous man of God in the temple. And what's the situation? Where is he? What's he Who has he seen when he says, my eyes have seen your salvation? Well, he's seen Jesus. He's come to the temple. Remember Mary and Joseph had brought baby Jesus to the temple to dedicate him at the temple. And Simeon comes up and he takes the baby in his arms, takes Jesus in his arms, and he blesses him. And he says, Lord, you can go ahead and let me die now because you fulfilled your word. I have seen your salvation. I have seen him. I have seen Jesus. You see, God's salvation is not a thing that he gives. God's salvation is a person. God's salvation is Jesus. For God so loved the world he gave what did he give? He gave salvation? No. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, he gave Jesus for us. God gave his son. Jesus is God's salvation for us. Interestingly enough, one more thing I want you to know about Psalm 51 verse 12. When David prays and says, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation, your salvation. The Hebrew word that David uses for salvation is from the, the Hebrew verb yasha. Yasha, uh, it, it means to deliver or to save. Yasha is the word that your salvation comes from that Hebrew verb yasha. You may have heard that word yasha in a different perspective. Matter of fact, I'd almost bet that you have were I a betting man because you've heard it as Yeshua. Yeshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. That's the name for Jesus. So all the way back in Psalm 51, 12, David talks about God's salvation. And of course, when God is sending Jesus, he says, you'll name him, call his name Jesus, for he shall, Yasha, he shall save his people from their sins. Salvation from sins comes in a person. It comes in Jesus makes me think that maybe we asked the wrong question in the first place. Instead of whose salvation is it, maybe we should ask, who is your salvation? And I know the answer. Your salvation, Lord, is Jesus. Jesus is your salvation. Jesus is God's salvation that God shares with us. It's our salvation from sin. Jesus is our salvation he saves us from our sins and gives us new life. That means that Jesus is not just God's salvation for us, but Jesus is our salvation for all of us who have committed our life to him, who have turned to him, who have repented and come home to Jesus to give our lives to him, to belong to him. Then Jesus is our salvation because God is sharing his salvation, his son with me. Uh, that means that for me, if I've given my life to Christ, and Jesus is my salvation because God is sharing his son with me. If I've repented and committed my life to Christ, then Jesus has saved me, and Jesus is then my salvation. Friends, Jesus is salvation. Yeshua is salvation. He saves us from our sins, and there is salvation in none other. When we pray David's psalm of repentance, when I pray Jesus' psalm of repentance, when I beg God to restore to me the joy of his salvation, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation, I know that that restored joy and that salvation only comes to me through Jesus, my Savior. God's joy and salvation can't come through works. It can't come from church attendance, doing good things. It can't come from just being nice to other people. The joy of God's salvation comes to us in Jesus, our Savior.
If you want salvation, there is only one way. If you want God's salvation, then come to Jesus. Draw close to Jesus. Get near to Jesus. If you want the joy of God's salvation, come to Jesus. Get near to Jesus. Acts 4.12 makes it abundantly clear. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, by which men have given among men by which we must be saved. There is only one name by which we can be saved and through which we can have our salvation, the joy of our salvation restored. That name is Jesus. Yeshua, God saves. God offers his salvation to us through Jesus. He offers us forgiveness and new life, redemption and new hope. He offers us joy in salvation through Jesus. The wages of our sin is is death, but the gift that God wants to give, the free gift of God, is eternal life, salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. And how does Jesus offer to you that salvation or offer to restore to you the joy of that salvation? Well, the only way it can happen is that Jesus went to the cross for us and he gave his life to pay the price for our sin. Remember, our sin separates us from God. If you've never trusted in Christ, you're separated from God, headed down a wrong path to forever be apart from God. Not what we want. If you've trusted your life to God, but sin is is in your life and it's not resolved, it's unrepentant and unresolved, then then that sin separates you from, from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, The Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your sins have separated between you and your God, and your iniquities have hidden his face from you that he will not hear. Our sins cause a division between us and God. That's a bad thing. But Jesus, through his sacrifice on the cross, took our sins upon himself, nailed them to the tree so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have life, so that we could have the joy of his salvation or have that joy restored through the cross and through the empty tomb, through the the suffering and the sacrifice of the cross, through the victory of the empty tomb, we can have joy in his salvation. For someone who's never been saved, that's how you get saved, by coming to the cross, giving yourself to Jesus, confessing Jesus as your Lord. Make him your Lord and he'll save you. He'll change you. He'll give you that joy. For someone who's already been saved, well, that same cross and that same empty tomb, through that God can restore the joy of his salvation in you when we repent and get things to rights with God. There is no joy in salvation apart from being right with God, having a willing spirit, willing to obey and to walk with God in righteousness. So David cried out, as can we, O Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me, help me to have that willing spirit, a willing and obedient spirit in you. You pray that prayer with David. Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. You pray that prayer and mean it from the depths of your heart. And I can promise, just like God answered David, he will answer you. God can restore to you the joy of his salvation. He's done his part. What about you? Join me with you in prayer. Father, thank you for giving your son and for allowing us to have not just salvation, but to have the joy of that salvation. Thank you, Father, for giving us yourself giving us your son so that we could have new life and forgiveness in you. Lord, I would pray that if there's even one here today needing to get things right with you to be saved, that, Father, today would be the day. That salvation, your salvation, Lord, it's good. And we want that salvation. So, Father, I pray that if there's one ready to make that decision to commit their life to you, that today would be the day. But, Father, I also pray for those who are already saved, who know that we're not close to you like we should be, like we used to be, not knowing the joy of your salvation like we should. Lord, we know that sin is what separates us. 
whether it's sins that we're committing that we shouldn't or things that we're omitting that we're not doing that you've asked us to. Our sin creates that separation between us and you. So, Father, help us. Help us to come to you, to repent, and to come clean with you so that we can have that joy of salvation, your salvation in us. I pray it and ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The song that we're going to sing is our song of response and invitation is, Now I Belong to Jesus. When you give your heart and your life to Him, when you commit your, yourself to Him, then you belong to Him. It's His salvation. You know, I, I didn't share it, but one of the ways I thought about it, you know, if, if I loan you my car, I still own the car, I pay for the car, the car is mine, but it's yours to drive for a while. Salvation's like that. It belongs to God, but He lets us drive it for a while. And then he takes us home to glory. If you need to get things settled with Jesus, now would be a really good time. If you're thinking of baptism, if you want to follow the Lord in baptism, then come today and we'll work on it for next week. If you want to give your life to Christ, I'd love to share with you and share with you some now and more later. If you want to join with the church, if you want to put your life to work for Jesus with this group of people, if God is talking, maybe God is saying, hey, you know what? You need to get some things right. You need to repent, and you better just be up there in front. If God is calling to you, and if you need to get things settled with Him, now is the time. Will you stand with me as we sing?